Two games on. Fifteen. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another Tweener at Tennis video today. Today, we have a very special guest and a very new type of guest because we never really talk about this subject, but we are going to be talking about doubles today. Bear in mind, this is in recent light of everything that's been going on, but that's just <laughs> a coincidence in my mind. But today, we have Will from Tennis Tribe, a strategic analyst for doubles teams, a podcaster. He recently interviewed, I believe it was Ashlyn Kruger and her partner during, which tournament mm -hmm. was that? That was the ATX Open, yeah, yeah, and the Austin, a, in the Austin Open, the inaugural Austin Open, I might, in fact, add. Yeah, but um, yeah. it's nice to have someone with a passion for doubles like Will. So, Will, welcome to the channel. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, talk about doubles, and um, yeah, I love talking about doubles, promoting doubles, playing doubles, studying doubles. So, uh, yeah, it's a ton of fun. Okay, so let's start with, well, the most broad question we can start with for you is why doubles um yeah so i started so i moved to austin texas back in uh 2015 mm -hmm. uh i had two friends living there within three months they both moved away and i didn't know anybody in austin so <laughs> i used uh used tennis as a way just to meet people um, love that austin has a great tennis community started playing usta leagues and tournaments started mm -hmm. playing a lot of doubles and I was just like kind of teaching myself how to play doubles. Um, I had never formally been taught like double strategy. Okay. So I started, I started blogging about it and, uh, people came up to me during tournaments and they would say, Oh, I love your doubles blog. And like, I didn't even know these people. Um, so word was kind of getting around around Texas, uh, about this new doubles blog. And then from there, um, that was 2016, um, so then in 20, I think 19 or 20, I started the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. I've had the newsletter going for like five years now. Uh, I started working with, uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy over at brain game tennis mm -hmm. on his website. Um, cause I have a background in like web design and marketing and stuff. So I helped him with that, learned a lot about the analytics side of the sport, um, mm -hmm. from his perspective, which is mostly singles. Okay. And then started doing that a little bit with doubles as well. So now I work with a, a few pro players um, kind of off and on uh, doing some analytics for doubles uh, as well as the podcast mm -hmm. um, and then still doing the newsletter uh, and just teaching club level players online um, how to play doubles uh, and then also covering the pro doubles tour and trying to make doubles more popular because it it just doesn't make sense to me that uh, pro doubles is not more popular. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really want tennis channel showing it more. I want, uh, people to be more familiar with names like, uh, Luisa Stefani, Gabby Dabrowski, Nicole mm -hmm. Melikar, um, Rajiv Ram, Joe Salisbury, uh, that sort of thing. So, um, it's all doubles centric, uh, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of different kind of aspects to it. No, it, it's it, all those people that you just mentioned also have, well, at least for Louisa, who also played college tennis and for college mm -hmm. tennis as well. And we'll go into it a little bit more today. But college tennis as well is kind of where the excitement starts for me, at least for doubles, because yeah. that's where you get to see three to four matches and all energetic. No one loses yeah. a single beat. No one loses a single breath playing doubles. Yeah. It's just it just makes it so much more fun to watch. And mm -hmm. Within the game, too, it definitely is on the back end of people's minds when they think of tennis. But when you go to the more popular areas, and I teach tennis as well as a full-time job, but the level I teach at is more casual, and they mm -hmm. only play doubles, which is crazy right. to me why they wouldn't watch more doubles yeah. rather than singles. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's a complex topic that i've got we could do like a 10 hour show and i probably wouldn't be able to share everything um <laughs> that i have on the topic but uh i i think it's um it is interesting so it's country specific too i think so i, I was okay. chatting with someone uh a, about a month ago from germany and she plays on a club team in germany so they, they run things a little bit differently the way i understand mm -hmm. it is 
Um, you're like a member at a club and then you go and play against other clubs, mm -hmm. but they do it differently. So like USTA, it's usually uh, three lines of doubles and then two lines of singles. And yeah. all the USTA teams I've played on, we're just like all trying to avoid playing the singles line, right? We all want to play doubles <laughs> and it's just so hard to find good singles players. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the teams will end up finding kids who are like right out of college um, and their rating might be kind of questionable and things like that. A little but, overblown. Uh, yeah. But th this girl from Germany I was talking to said they play, I might not have this exactly right, but it's, it's directionally correct. They play five lines of singles and two lines of doubles. It was something like that. It was it was so much more singles than doubles. Um, and then when I okay. talk to players on tour, players on tour say the same thing. Like in the US, their crowds are much better um, when I talk to doubles players on tour. So when mm -hmm. they go to play in Italy or France or, you know, wherever it is in Europe, the, the crowds are just not quite as strong. They don't enjoy mm -hmm. doubles as much. So part of it's country specific. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a big marketing problem uh, right now. If you are a doubles fan uh, and you do know that pro doubles even exists, it's very difficult to find on TV. Um, you have to pay for a Tennis Channel Plus subscription or an ESPN Plus subscription. Um, tennis TV, too, if you're located in the tennis, United States. Yeah, Tennis TV, you can pay for that. Um, so it's all like kind of paywalled. Um, but a lot of tennis club players who play doubles may not even know that pro doubles exists. Um, because the tours just don't really market it a lot. So mm -hmm. uh, we had the WTA finals here in Fort Worth um, back in November. And if you saw all the ads on social media leading up to the tournament or even walked around the arena during the tournament, all of the banners and all of the advertising, it's all the singles players. So yep. you would you, you could literally have bought a ticket, showed up, started walking around the arena, and still not know that doubles was going on. So mm -hmm. it's it's a big problem with marketing, with TV networks. Um, and then of course, the other side of it is the players themselves uh, can do a better job of, of putting themselves out there, which a lot of them do. Um, some of them don't for understandable reasons, but anyways, there's a lot of different sides to that. I, I totally agree because with that idea of not publicizing it even more than it should, because these are mm -hmm. professional athletes at this point, and the, I don't think anyone should question their dedication to their craft. And mm -hmm. when we went to Fort Worth and we were at the WTA finals back in November, uh, shout mm -hmm. out to Grant Chen for from SMU uh, getting us tickets to that. That was a lot of fun getting to experience that for the first time going to an event like that. And the stadium mm -hmm. was incredible. You yeah, can it was. See, yeah. It, it, for, you can tell too that when you walk in, you can see the draw for the singles, but then you have to walk around to the back entrance to see the draw for the WTA uh, for the doubles finals. Mm -hmm. And yeah, staying for the doubles as well was pretty entertaining. I think we watched, I watched Kudamatova and Mertens, Mertens versus Mertens. and Elise Mertens versus Dabrowski and Olmos. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah. and that's still a fun match to watch. Yeah. But going back to your statement of it's not publicized enough. And I was talking about this with someone else this past week about after the Opelka comments came out that double for me, when you do media days at mm -hmm. any tournament, if you don't know what those are, it's, to give context, it's the day before the tournament starts. You get to sit down with all the players. You get to sit down and talk to them a little bit about how their season's going, ask them personal questions, things within mm -hmm. that nature, take photos uh, to promote the tournament, get some quotes before it even starts. But for media days, I, I don't think I've been to a media day where they've had the number one seed for doubles or the number two seed for doubles or yeah. have a partnership. Yeah, they don't do it. <laughs> but they don't do it. I, I'm not yeah. entirely sure why, but that... It could be like an easy thing for them to add that would mm -hmm. just help help get it a little bit more exposure, right? Like maybe mm -hmm. the doubles team or player says something interesting and mm -hmm. some big media outlet you know, it sparks something for them and they're like, oh, I'm going to write a piece on like this doubles team, you know, mm -hmm. um, like especially if they had because a lot of the doubles teams play singles, too, especially on the women's side. So like 
if if they had Krechikova or like Coco Golf or something, mm-hmm. um, and and just ask her more questions about doubles, which I like, I'm doing uh, when I am able to attend these events. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean that that could spark you know a new story that helps get doubles a little bit more in the limelight. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of things the tours can be doing, the tournaments can be doing, um, and we're starting to see like. A little bit of traction. Um, obviously, I didn't agree with Riley's comments, but mm-hmm. um, I do think it it actually might have helped doubles a little bit because so many people kind of came on board against him. Uh, yes. And like even the BBC, I think, had uh, Gabby Dabrowski on mm-hmm. um, for like a quick interview afterwards, uh, kind of about the comments, right? And maybe wonderful person, by the way, if you guys haven't yeah. seen it. Um, I think we inter- interviewed her back in 2019 at the Rogers Cup when it was in yeah. Toronto. Just okay. overall great person. Like a yeah, lot of these great. players are. She, Yeah, she's a huge advocate for, for doubles and she's on like the WTA Players Council, I believe, mm-hmm. or at least she was. Um, mm mm-hmm. So yeah, maybe that doesn't happen if Riley doesn't say that. Um, mm-hmm. But anyways, yeah, there, there's tons of stuff that I think the tours and individual tournaments can be doing to um, that are super easy and like don't cost them a lot of money, but mm-hmm. they do help out the doubles players and, and get a little more exposure. And going back to that comment that you just made with the singles players playing doubles, and this is kind of where we can get into those. I'm sorry, I just got my girlfriend a plant and now there's flies everywhere and i want to murder everyone <laughs> um guys i was saying we're kind of getting into those riley opelka comments and we can go full into it after i say this too with singles players playing doubles as well two mm-hmm. players that you've already mentioned which i think are huge actually three as well if we completely dive into it barbara krejcikova she's won multiple mm-hmm. doubles grand slams she's a Grand Slam singles winner as well for the French Open. Coco Goff yep. made mm-hmm. the doubles final of Roland Garros. So please correct me if I'm getting these results wrong. She That's made right. the finals of Roland Garros with Jessica Bagula, who was another top 10 player last year. Yeah. Last year on both ends. And we've seen it in years past when Azarank and Barty played together before Barty retired when they mm-hmm. were both in the top 10. Mm-hmm. So it, yes, it does help that they won a grand slam in singles or they made a splash on the singles tour, but it doesn't make it any less entertaining. Like Sinyakova, mm-hmm. who's number one in the world right now from the Czech Republic is playing singles right now. And I current and sh- as of recording this, she's up six, three in the first set at the Miami open in the first round against Claire Lou. So yeah. it, it, I get it. I get why he's saying that, but to me, you got to give them more credit where credit's due. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think um, I, I want to have a conversation with him really. Like I, I want to know what, so his quote exactly, let me pull it up here. Um, and while you're Twitter and while you're yeah. pulling that up, I just want to give people context for those who don't know what happened recently in the tennis space is Riley Opelka, a former top 20 player in the world from the United States said, and the quote I believe you're pulling up is he said that doubles would, is not entertaining to watch. It doesn't pull crowds. And the only people that watch doubles is if two singles players are playing together or if the Bryan yeah. brothers are playing. So it's so somebody asked him, I don't know, I don't even know who it was, but somebody asked him, what would you change about the ATP tour? On his and Instagram. His res- his, he was doing okay. a QA on Instagram and someone okay. asked him. He said, I'm answering three questions, and this was one of the questions. Okay. Um, how would you so change? He said, it Go says, ahead. quote, quote, get rid of doubles. Only time people watch are when it's singles players or the Brian Bros. Mm-hmm. So, so that's something he would change about the ATP tour. So, okay, got mm-hmm. that. Now I want to know what problem is he trying to solve by getting rid of doubles? I assume it's some kind of financial thing because mm-hmm. it, it, it might be the case um, for the ATP that doubles cost them money. Like that, that might be true. Like it might be one of those things where like, cause I, I listened to him on Craig Shapiro's podcast and 
he was saying like, look, it's not personal. It's just a business decision. And it, that might be true. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but it might be yeah. true that the ATP tour spends more money on doubles than it gets in return. And that's probably really difficult for them to measure. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, that might be true. Now, then my question is, okay, is the problem doubles or something else? Like, is it doubles okay. as a product or is it something else? And in my mind, I don't think the problem is doubles. Um, so the, if you took, like, if you were to start a brand new tennis tour and you were to take two people and I actually recorded a, a video on this that I haven't published yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to do that this week. I need to. Okay. So if, if you were to take, start a brand new tennis tour, you were to grab two people and say, okay, you're the CEO of our singles tour. You're the CEO of our doubles tour. Mm -hmm. Um, singles guy. Okay. You're going to get, uh, 99% of our advertising revenue. You're going to get all of our TV network, except doubles will show you for the finals of the Grand Slams, but that's it. Uh, all your <laughs> other matches are going to be behind this $100 paywall. Uh, at the tournament itself, mm -hmm. we're going to have billboards around town promoting the tournament. Only singles players are allowed to be on those billboards. Um, at the tournament, when we advertise on social media, it's only going to be singles players. We're not going to advertise the doubles players. What do you think is going to happen five years down the road? The attendance for the doubles matches is going to be almost zero. Yeah. So that's essentially what's happening right now with the WTA and ATP. Mm -hmm. They're just not marketing the doubles at all. And no. the Bryans happen to be, they had a few advantages for them. One, they were both from the same country. It happened to be mm -hmm. the US, which is a big advantage. Mm -hmm. Um they stayed together forever. So when teams switch up, like that makes it difficult. Uh, but also like their brothers and they were good at marketing themselves. Like they created this kind of brand and persona. And I would bet if these singles players didn't have all these advertising dollars and the ATP and WTA behind them, they probably wouldn't be nearly as good as the Bryan brothers were at marketing themselves, but they don't have to because they have all this help from the tours. So the Bryan brothers were uniquely good at that. And most people aren't that good at that. And most doubles players now are not that good at that because they're, they're tennis players. They're not, you know, they're not advertisers. Marketers. Yeah. They're not advertisers. They're their own so, entity. Right. So like the Bryans were so good at that and you can't expect other players to be good at that. So mm -hmm. if the tours would just put a little bit more effort into the marketing of doubles. If the TV networks would show them a little bit more, I do think, and like I said earlier, it is kind of country specific, but I do think in general, people would start to uh, gravitate towards doubles more and watch it more on TV and, and the attendance would be better. Um, now that said, the attendance was fantastic at Indian Wells. I just got mm -hmm. back uh, last Wednesday um, and the doubles attendance was was. I have some pictures on my Twitter page. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's my post is pinned to the top, but yeah, the doubles is. attendance, even, even for the, the matches that didn't have single stars, which is another debate, like who's a single star. Um, even for matches where it's all doubles players, like the attendance was really good. So I, I think mm -hmm. California and Indian Wells loves doubles. Um, mm -hmm. So anyways, there's, we could go down a whole rabbit hole, but like it, if he's trying to, um, save the ATP tour money so that can be distributed more to the, mm -hmm. say, let's say like lower ranked singles players or something. I think there's better ways to do that. Um, so that that's my part of my rant. Uh, that <laughs> no, I, would, I and I'll no, argue I, with Riley Opelka on. <laughs> well, I I think the I think there the issue with a lot of people is when people and I think I'm gonna there was a lot of good quotes from the Craig Shapiro podcast. So I'm going to shout out Greg for using some of his quotes that he used during his podcast. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of, it was very quick how well he got him after those comments. And one of the things that Opelka said was, if you ask any junior, if junior tennis player, if they wanted to be a double star, yeah. like, would you, would you want to do that? It'd be like, no, I don't think so. Because, it's it it was never appealing to them because yeah. they always want to have that stardom 
of winning a Grand Slam. And a lot of yeah. players, too. And it's ironic that, and I, and I agree, I totally agree. We did an interview with um, Robert Galloway, who played college tennis at Wofford, um, mm-hmm. who, and we talked to him, like, when did you know you were going to be a doubles player? It just, and I believe my rough quote from him, and if you want to watch that video, I'll pin it to this uh, comment section. He said that one, I, once I started seeing the results in doubles, that's where I started taking a turn, right. which is, I think if you ask any doubles player right now, that's, that's kind of the genuine direction to how yeah. they became a double specialist. And I'll put that in quotes, because right. if you look at every single, I'm looking at the rankings now for the men, not a single person, I think in the top 20 is in the top 100 for singles. If you look yeah. at the women's, you have a lot more players, a lot, in, yeah. a lot more players inside the top 100 that also play on the singles tour. Well, does that right. make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, um, the, I think one of the main reasons for that is that the men are playing best of five in the singles at grand slams. Okay. Um, so like, since they have to play best of five in singles, like they just can't play doubles as well. You know, yeah. um, since the women are playing best of three in singles, like they can manage both and play every other day and mm-hmm. it's not quite as, as taxing on their body. Um, so I think that's one of the big reasons for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, as far as, um, the, the single stars on the women's tour, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like that, that's one of the other thing, like issues I have with his comment. Mm-hmm. Or, or at least a thing we we'd have to dig into more is like what do you mean by single star? So like, mm-hmm. Coco, let's take Coco Golf. If you look at her career, she's actually probably had a better doubles career than singles career. So why does singles get to take her as a single star? Like why can't I take her as a double star who happens to be good at singles too? Right? Just because there's more prize money in singles, just because the WTA like markets her for her singles or as an individual, like really she's a tennis star who's awesome at singles and doubles. You could say that about Pagula as well. And I Um, feel like golf, golf to me, and I'll kind of play devil's advocate here. Golf mm -hmm. became a star as a singles player. Well, as a well-known name after she beat Venus. So maybe that may not be the best example, but I can give you another one on the women's tour with, Let's see. I mean, Krejcikova is a good one, right? Krejcikova is like, a good one. Katie McNally is yeah, a good a one. Katie, Katie McNally, McNally yeah. probably, probably has a better doubles career than a uh, singles career as of right now. She definitely does. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, she definitely does. Players like that, as well as Taylor Townsend, great junior, mm-hmm. still seeing a lot of success in doubles versus mm-hmm. singles. So, so, like, like back to your junior comment to. Um, mm-hmm. So if I'm a junior, like, let's say I'm like 14 or something and and Mm -hmm. have a really good uh, junior ranking and Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to go pro. Um, This kind of goes back to like the marketing thing. And then also it's a huge prize money issue, right? So on on that BBC interview, Dabrowski said um, doubles players make around eight to 10% of what singles players make. So Mm -hmm. Even when I interview somebody like Ellen Perez, who's top 20 in doubles, Mm -hmm. um, she made the semifinals with Nicole Melikar Martinez at the U.S. Open last year. Uh, Uh, Former college player as well, too. Former college player at Georgia. Yeah. Um, So even when I interview her now, she's still saying like, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to focus on my singles because the prize money gap is so big. Mm-hmm. that they would be dumb not to just try it in singles because all you need is like one good month where you get through a qualifier to Grand Slam, maybe get a lucky draw, win a round, maybe your opponent gets injured in round two, and then all of a sudden you're in the third round of a Grand Slam. That's more prize money than you're going to make probably all year combined in doubles. Yeah. Um. So So they have to prioritize their singles career. And of course, nobody's going to at 14 or 16 or 18 say, oh, I want to be a world-class doubles player. Like, why would they? So it's going to take 
that prize money gap to start to and the popularity gap to start mm -hmm. to kind of converge. And like maybe it's a case where doubles is never as popular as singles, but if instead of eight to ten percent on the prize money gap, and we'll just use that because it's like a tangible number. Mm -hmm. Um, if it were to get up to maybe 25% or like 30 to 40%, mm -hmm. um, then at that point, some people, some juniors might say, okay, I know I can make triple the money in singles, yeah, but, uh, I like doubles. So I'm going to play doubles, but right now yeah. it's, I'm going to make 10 times the money in singles. Of course, I'm going to try that. Like you have yeah. to. And, so, well, I, from that perspective, I've never, I never really knew that. Well, in terms mm -hmm. of the percentages, I knew how much of the pay gap was, but it's yeah. true because the amount of money that you make with your doubles partner has to be split. If we break it right. down, it does have to be split. So what they would make in a tournament, if they won it, they'd still have to split it and still be less than making a first round of a grand slam playing right. singles. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. If if they were to boost the incentive incentive, excuse me. Yeah. For doubles by bringing in more money, by bringing in more value or bringing more attention to them. Mm -hmm. Because I don't understand why they can't make the prize money for doubles at Grand Slams a million. Is yeah, that is that I, weird? To, is that weird to ask, or is that just oh because know. they don't bring it in, they don't deserve? Yeah, I'm not sure. I I th I think it's one of those things where, um, look like we can sit at like I've had these conversations with plenty of players on tour, coaches, former players. Um, a lot of them are recorded on my podcast, and mm -hmm. they. You know, we can sit around and, and say the tours need to promote doubles more. Um, mm -hmm. We can wait on that to happen. We can wait on the tournaments um, to, you know, reach out and promote and market the doubles better. Mm -hmm. Or we can just start doing it ourselves. And that's what yeah. kind of what I'm trying to do with with the Tennis Tribe and my podcast is like, mm -hmm. I don't want to sit down and sit around and just wait for the ATP or WTA to like take action because... Um, mm -hmm. they don't have to, like they can tomorrow cut the doubles, like Riley Opelka said, if they want to. Yeah. Um, so like, I, I don't want to sit around and wait on them for that. So like, I feel like the players and then like what I'm trying to do, um, need to market it outside of what the tour is doing. Um, mm -hmm. people need to cover it more outside of what the tour's uh, going to do, because if you do sit around and, and wait for the ATP tour, WTA tour to, um, do something to do that like maybe they won't um yeah. so i i think the prize money isn't going to just change everything um I, well i don't think it's just gonna go up like yeah with without them seeing that demand first um yeah because if if they were to tomorrow like make the prize money a million maybe more singles players enter the doubles draw then maybe more fans start to watch then the tours start to see mm -hmm. okay maybe there is something to this but i don't think that's going to happen like i don't think they're just going to let's raise it to a million and see what happens i think first that demand has to come and people mm -hmm. have to start watching more and attending more and then they'll be like oh wow like doubles is kind of catching on maybe we should raise the prize money i think that's the more likely scenario um, and that's kind of what, what I want to try to push for and, and make happen. So if I was to give you a scenario, and I'm going to give you one right now, if I was to come to you and tell you, I don't like doubles, change my mind, how would how would you do it? Well, first, I would ask, why don't you like doubles? Because <laughs> um, it, so, okay, let's, let's have a pretend scenario here. I, okay. It's one of those, it's one of those memes of, I don't like doubles change my mind with the guy in the coffee mug like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen that. So so let's pretend like we're going to have this conversation. So you come up to me. I don't like doubles. You ask me, why don't I like doubles? Well, for me, it just doesn't seem like you need that much athleticism. A lot of the doubles guys are over the age of 30 in the top one in the top 10. Um, I feel like you can just win 
because if you're athletic enough, you can just win automatically against these guys. So, so doubles is like a much more strategy game than it is like physical, right? You Rohan Bopana just won uh, Indian Wells mm-hmm. with Matt Ebden and Rohan is 43 years old. Um, so he uh, is not at the peak of his athletic career, uh, but he was probably playing the best doubles of his career over the past couple of weeks. Um, and a lot of that is definitely strategy based. So like I get doubles is not going to be for everyone. Um, I just think it is for a lot more people than uh, the amount of attention it's getting now. So if you prefer to watch, like there was a guy I met at Indian Wells who said like, oh, I don't like doubles. I like watching the pretty ground strokes and singles. Um, And he, it sounds like he just enjoys technique and watching people kind of, you know, hit ground strokes back and forth from the baseline. And that's okay. Um, To me, that's, kind of boring. Like, I don't, I don't like that. I like watching the angles, the volleys, the fast pace, um, uh, points the how the teams work and move together with their partners. I find all the strategy stuff a lot more interesting. So I I think it's okay that some people don't like doubles. Um, I think that's totally fine, but, uh, I think there's a lot of people who are sitting there mostly watching singles. And if they were exposed to doubles more, I think they would start to like doubles more than singles right now. So I think the gap's just wider than it should be, mostly because of TV networks, advertising, marketing, all that sort of stuff. So here's another question I would so ask I, you. I don't know if I convinced you. Of no, no, no. There, it's, but... So let me ask you another question about that. For mm-hmm. when I watch doubles on TV, it looks slow. It looks like they're not along points. And there doesn't look like there's a crowd there. What would you say to that? Um, well, I'd be curious, like which match you were watching. So, so it's true that towards the end of the tournament, the doubles crowds are not great. Um, so if you were at Indian Wells week one, early week two, when I was there, the doubles crowds were insane. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a match for uh, Coco and Jessica, their second round match. They lost to. Um, uh, Suchiati and, and Kato, who ended up making the semis, and uh, it was court four. It was one and one out. People were like almost climbing the fences to get a look at this doubles match. People were actually going to Stadium Five, where there was a singles match going on. They were going to the top of the bleachers and sitting in the corner so that they could look over to Stadium Four to watch the doubles match. So, um, the crowds were crazy during week one early week two if you watch the semifinals and finals on tv the doubles crowds are not very good uh the main reason for that is because people aren't buying grounds passes for semifinals and finals because i don't even think they sell them uh, because there's only matches on stadium one Mm -hmm. so what's being shown is the singles matches and then the doubles matches are kind of in between as an afterthought the tickets um I didn't look for Indian Wells. I imagine it says like semifinals, men's singles, stadium one, something like that. It probably doesn't even mention doubles on it. So a lot of fans don't even know that the doubles semifinals is going on before the single semifinals or after, uh, depending on the tournament. So I think a lot of it is just, again, it goes back to a marketing problem. Like the, the crowds are really good when people have grounds passes because they'll hear, oh, Coco's playing doubles. Let's go watch that. Um, and they have all these different uh, courts with uh, access to all these different courts, but s- semifinals, finals, like there's only a couple of matches. It's only one court. Uh, and the only thing that's marketed is singles. So people just don't show up for the the doubles matches as much. So again, I think that goes back to a marketing problem. Um, and then the other aspect is, is where were you watching it? Right. So mm-hmm. the, the Rome, I think the women's final last year in Rome was Dabrowski and Olmos. I forgot who they played, uh, but it was at the same time as Djokovic and Sitsipas singles <laughs> final. 
So there was about like seven people in the stands for this women's doubles final at a WTA 1000 event. And it's like, okay, they're competing with Djokovic and Tsitsipas in the room final. Like that should not be scheduled at the same time. Those were the only two matches that day. Um, and they so played it, them at the same time. They played them at the same time. So it's like play it a little bit before or right after to like help them get a little bit of a crowd to stick around and watch and maybe get to know who Gabby Dabrowski is or Juju almost is. Mm -hmm. But they played him at the same time on different courts. So there was absolutely zero attention on her doubles match. And it's just totally unfair. Like you're setting them up for failure. Um, so I, I just, again, I, I think it goes back to like scheduling, marketing, um, being broadcasted on TV. I so, just don't think it's a product problem. So if I was to throw a doubles only tennis tournament mm -hmm. would that be successful as throwing a singles only tournament uh it would depend on who you got to play in it so this is um i, I was listening to another podcast recently where they asked this question and the first issue would be prize money right like and competing tournaments. So if you were to do this like during other tournaments where singles is going on, then the singles players would probably go play the singles tournaments because the prize money would be bigger. But if you were to do like block out a week, have good prize money that would draw all the tennis stars and it's a doubles only tournament, yes, I think people would show up. But again, what people want to see is tennis stars. They don't Care, seem to care at least in the u.s they don't seem to care if it's singles or doubles right they just want to watch coco golf play you know if yeah. she's playing doubles sure they're good they'll go watch her play doubles if she's playing singles they'll go watch her play singles it doesn't matter um so if it were a doubles only tournament with only the the doubles specialist whatever that means um and we'd <laughs> have to define that uh but if it were only, let's say, nobody inside the top 100 in singles is allowed to play in this doubles-only tournament, I don't think the attendance would be very high because people don't know the top doubles players. They don't know who um, Neil Skupski is. They don't know who Joe Salisbury is because they're not tennis stars because they haven't been marketed because doubles hasn't been marketed. They're not shown on TV. So they're just starting kind of the race way, way back from where the singles players are. So if I was, so one thing that happened this year, and I'm kind of done playing devil's advocate right now um, okay. and asking these questions um, for uh, challengers announced that during major tournaments or during um, masters, 1000s, bigger tournaments that they would have a challenger 175, which mm -hmm. is, for those of you who don't know, a 250 is uh, an ATP 250 or WTA 250 means that there's $250,000 total worth of prize money for the entire tournament, entire field. And a challenger would just be half of that. And this is the first year they're doing it. So a 175 is half of 250. Math is easy when you mm -hmm. already know it. But <laughs> if they were to have not a singles tournament or a challenger, if they had a doubles only tournament, with the same prize money as a 250 after like the second week of a major uh of a major or the second week of a masters 1000 do you think people would be attracted to that idea yeah th this is something a lot of people uh i've heard mention um like somebody had the idea of starting the double straw in week two of mm -hmm. grand slams Okay. Um, and just doing doing it during all of week two. So that way, like if a single star happens to lose second round of singles, like they can still enter the doubles draw and it'll mm -hmm. help boost the the viewership and the attendance for the doubles matches. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's an idea worth testing. I, I think we'd probably run into some problems that mm -hmm. nobody saw coming. Um mm -hmm. but to run a a two fifty, maybe in like the general area of um, let's say like you know, the U.S. Open is going on and during week two, um, they run a 250 in Boston or something. So the players mm -hmm. who lose week one can head up to Boston and, and uh, enter this doubles tournament. Um, you know, I, I, I think it would depend on the players. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think more singles players who lose week one would 
go up and try to enter that 250 and, and play it um mm -hmm. if for nothing else just to get more match play in and for fun mm -hmm. um i know like curios has said he hates practicing so he'd rather just enter the doubles draw and play doubles <laughs> um so I, I think there's a lot of players like that pagula has said the same thing um not quite as extreme but something kind of similar like okay you know uh she just likes playing doubles and it's another form of practice um so i think a lot of singles players would probably enter that and again if they were were tennis stars not necessarily single stars but if they were popular tennis. Yes. Then fans fans would show up and fans would watch them regardless of if it's a singles match or a doubles match. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's funny that you mentioned Kyrgios too is and for the past two years, I have to say uh, for the first time, Kokonakis and Kyrgios uh, played together and mm -hmm. won the Australian Open. They won yeah. it back in 2021 and then no 2022. 2022, me. yeah. 2022, excuse me, because this past year, Rinky Hichikata, 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 yeah, Hichikata. Thank you. I'm yeah. totally gonna get screwed for that on <laughs> the internet. Um, <laughs> no. So I apologize, Rinky. Uh, he, no, it's a tough one. <laughs> it's a tough one. But um, former college player played at UNC, played alongside fellow Aussie Jason Kubler, and mm -hmm. they paired up for the first time in one Australia. Right. So. And another quote from Opelka, since it's been so popular uh, today <laughs> on this chat, um, he said, "How is it possible that two tennis, two singles players, can match up, can pair together for the first time and beat all these guys that are, and we're using this loosely, double specialists?" Yeah. How I think for me, it's that question of how come they can do that? Shouldn't the doubles players that are in the top 10 be able to beat these guys if they've never played together or if they never practice together in that way? Um, yes, they should be able to, and they can. And sometimes they do. Um, there was a few <laughs> factors there. One was, I mean, obviously the Aussie crowd. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, so Kubler and Hitchikata played Indian Wells. They lost first round to Mackie McDonald, who's definitely a singles player, although he's played some doubles as well. And he teamed up with Austin Krychek, who is a double doubles specialist player. for sure. And McDonald and Krychek beat him 6'1", 6 6'3". 6 mm -hmm. uh, so that that was at Indian Wells. So um, I think the Aussie crowd had a big effect. Uh, mm -hmm. I also would probably argue a little bit with Riley on like, like I don't know this this there's a gray area between like singles players and doubles players right like Rinky is a really good doubles player yeah um he happens to focus on singles because singles you get paid 10 times the amount of money like we yeah. talked about uh, as you do doubles so like of course he's focused on singles um but that like like why because the money's more, he's playing that more. But like, why do we get to call him just a singles player and not a doubles player? Like, he's also a really good doubles player. Um, and so is Kubler. So like, they're both really good from the baseline. They take the ball early, which takes away time from the net player. Mm -hmm. um, they're both solid at the net. They have great serves, great returns. Mm -hmm. um, so like, they just went on a tear. The Aussie crowd got behind them. They played with more energy than anybody can reasonably sustain for an entire mm -hmm. grand slam um just because of they were feeding off that crowd so much um mm -hmm. so yeah they went on a run um just like curios and kokonakis did the year before um so I, I don't think it's ridiculous that that they did that um mm -hmm. i didn't pick them to win the tournament um but in retrospect it's like yeah it was a little surprising but it's not like totally shocking that uh that they did that they're both really good doubles players it, what's what would you say is as a strategic analysis as yourself mm -hmm. and for someone that's been talking about doubles for a long time now what makes them that different mm -hmm. to beat doubles specific players how What's the besides them being early baseliners and taking away time mm -hmm. from the net players? What makes them that good to just come in, or for anyone, yeah. let's just say, as um, singles players that played uh, 
doubles as well. I think uh, the best yeah. example I can think of right now is Fabio Fonini, who won yeah. Monte Carlo mm-hmm. against Nadal and then is now primarily, and there's a rumor that he might retire this year, um, yeah. he's been playing doubles with Bolelli, another Italian mm-hmm. who started in singles and is now focusing on doubles with Fonini. How does someone like that transition into double so quickly and so well that they can start yeah. being these guys that have been doing this for a longer period of time? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, the, the doubles game is kind of evolved a lot. Um, especially on the, the men's side over the last 20 or so years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it of course used to be the case where you, you just had to serve in volley and you had to get to the net. Now you see a lot of, even double specialists um, like uh, Neil Skupski, mm-hmm. um, Marcelo Ravelo, mm-hmm. um, who are b- both top 10, uh, they'll serve and stay back. Um, yeah. So for Rinky and Jason, uh, before I totally analyze someone like strategically, I actually like to get a bunch of data. So I get ma- the matches okay. tagged and like, like Bring totally... It. J- yeah, I totally analyze it. Um, I haven't done that for them, but okay. in general, in general, for singles players like them, Fabio Fognini, there's a few things that help. But Rublev's really good at this. So, mm-hmm. um, one is is being able to step in and take your returns early. Mm-hmm. Um, so Rublev is the perfect example. Like he's had some good success in doubles actually because he, on his ground strokes as well as returns, he takes the ball so early. Mm-hmm. the net player has no time to poach. So you can mm-hmm. imagine if like, if you're up at the net and you see Medvedev. Um, oh, so far back. Butt, yeah. With his butt, like on the fence. Yeah. Um, And he takes a crack at a forehand. You've got like three or four seconds to get over there, poach, put that mm-hmm. ball away. Right. Versus if Rublev's taking that return inside the baseline He's taking away all your time, even if he's not hitting it as hard, which Mm -hmm. in his case, he does hit it as hard. As hard as he can Um, every single time. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, You just don't have any time to react. So it kind of neutralizes the net player. And even if you do poach, you might miss the volley because it's just such a difficult volley. Um, So Rinky and Jason both did that. They stepped forward and just ripped returns and ripped ground strokes. Another thing that Fognini is really good at is the ability to go either direction Mm -hmm. off of both wings. So Mm -hmm. a lot of players, um, especially like in the ad court, for example, a lot of players can rip their backhand cross court, but down Mm -hmm. the line, um, and it's a fine line at the pro level, like they all have this shot, but some of them have it a lot more effectively than others. Mm -hmm. And the top singles players, you know, definitely have it, but that down the line backhand from the ad court, Mm-hmm. that being a threat for Fognini is is a big weapon because mm-hmm. that kind of makes that opposing net player um, not able to to cheat towards the middle as much. Um, okay. So being able to go both directions off both wings, cross court and down the line uh, is a big thing. And then, of course, having a good serve is great. Um, being a good net player uh, is, is super effective. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all the traditional double stuff, but those two ground stroke things are, are something I don't think people um, really realize um, how important that is to be able to take the ball early and go both directions mm-hmm. uh, off of both sides. And I think Rinky and Jason um, both did that really well um, and just kind of caught fire down in Australia. So let me ask you this, and this kind of popped into my mind because I think Opelka said this during the podcast as well. Um Guys like Isner and Sock, who can just pick up playing doubles together again, can win mm-hmm. consistently. Mm-hmm. And I guess that big serve from Isner and Sock having a great hands and having a wicked forehand. Yeah. Do you think if Jack Sock fully committed to doubles, he would be the number one player in the world? Um, Maybe. He'd, he'd be in the conversation. I mean, he'd be around there. Um, I was, What's I was holding him this, back? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe just playing more. Um, he doesn't enter that many doubles tournaments. Um, when so he does, it could he be wins, as simple as that. Which is ironic. Um, he, he does well. Uh, so I was actually looking at this last week when they were making their run. They lost in the semis to Bopana and Ebden, who had a, just a great game plan against Sock. Um, yeah. And just totally neutralized him. It was a close match, I think seven six, seven six, but they mm-hmm. 
did a really nice job. Uh, but over their last, um, I tweeted about this. I don't remember exactly, but it was over their last, I think, 24 matches. Isner was like 20 and four in doubles and played with a bunch of different partners, right? He yeah. won Miami with her coach last year. He made the finals in Rome with Diego Schwartzman, who like, <laughs> if you're going to, if you're going to give me like a singles player, who's not a doubles player, like Diego Schwartzman's the guy, the epitome um, of that guy. And Isner made the finals in doubles with him in Rome. Uh, so Isner was at the time I tweeted this out, I think 20 and four over his last 24 matches and sock was like 17 and seven. Um, so like people say, you know, that, and they interviewed, um, Isner after the match, uh, I think they had won their quarterfinals and said, what's it like to play with such a fantastic double star? And I, I, that's when I Googled it and looked up their, like went back through and looked up their records. And I was like, man, like Isner's playing as good, if not better doubles than sock right now. So like, I don't know why everybody's <laughs> giving sock, like all this credit all for the them credit. making this run, like. As well, soon as they won it last year, he teams up with Hercotch, who's a good doubles player, and then he makes the finals in room with Schwartzman. So it's like, and we can get into why Isner's a good doubles player, but he is, he's a good doubles player. Like he could keep it going for another five or 10 years if he wanted to play doubles. Well, it's, it's one, he had great success in college playing doubles as well for Georgia. Um, mm-hmm. He, with his big serve and big forehand, it allows him to play to his strengths all the time. Yeah, And he has the ability to constantly be on his favorite side, which is the do side, in my opinion. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, when you huge. S- it's huge. It, it, seeing guys like that have that success, I mean, Isner, it's pretty straightforward why he's a good doubles player. It's not, at least in my mind, for a casual tennis fan to say, okay, if I was to ask you why is John Isner good at doubles, they would say his serve is insane and he gets to hit his forehand the whole time right but there's like like when you watch him and sock play um and i guess this is why everybody like gives sock all the credit for their success but like sock has the points where he's like running outside the doubles alley and hitting around the net post or running down a ball in the stands or yeah you know poaching from like the other side of the court and like sprinting across the court and hitting this like jumping forehand. So it's like all the flash, but Isner, um, and, and this is probably true. I never thought of this about this until now, but like singles players who have big holes in their game actually might be really good at doubles because Isner doesn't have a good backhand. You can hide that on the doubles court. He doesn't have a good return. He only has to return half of the time. And what he is actually good at on his return is stepping in and taking it early and just taking a big cut. Yeah. So like, you're probably not going to break him. And once per set, he's going to land two of those returns. Mm -hmm. And then he got his break. And that's it. Like, that's all. And then he covers like, you know, 27 feet at the net. An insane amount of. (laughs) So Yeah. Yeah. So it's like that, that he's able to hide his weaknesses, accentuate his strengths and his return happens to be like perfect for it. So like it, it just makes, I don't know. It kind of makes intuitive sense that, that he's good at doubles. I agree. And it's funny that I'm going to go back to my last statement of the age of which people can play doubles because Popana who won Indian Wells with Matt Ebden, Mm -hmm. oldest, oldest man to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. At to win currently a Masters 1000, yeah, a Masters 1000, I should say. Thank you. He's 43. Yeah. He's currently up to yeah. 12 in the in the world. Yeah, the youngest person that I can find in doubles in the top 100. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Is 24, and it's Purcell. Hmm. Okay. And, I and he's think, not going to play double. And he's going to fall out of the doubles rankings soon, because he's he's focusing on singles this year. He's not playing especially as much doubles. Yes, yeah. even though last year he had some great success in doubles, right? Well, Hitchy Hitchy Cot is in there, and he's twenty two. But yeah, but he's um, not. He's not in the top one hundred, is he? Uh, I see him at thirty six right now. 
Because all of his points are from the Australian Open, right? So you win. I have. Open. Are you on the live rankings one? Or the uh, ATP site? I'm on the ATP site. And if you I go just to, clicked on doubles. If you go to live tennis rankings as of right now, he's mm -hmm. not. Uh, currently, Kubler's at 30. Interesting. Okay. And Rinky's at 33. So he's 22. But that's the youngest age. At least in my mind. Yeah. So it, it it's funny. And I feel like Sinia Kova just retired from her match, by the way. Huh. And she was up a set. That's weird. Um, oh, no. I hope uh, she can play doubles. ADHD <laughs> in my head right there. Um, <laughs> but I don't think it's weird not seeing someone younger because I feel like as a singles player, you can be under the age of 20, 20 or below and still make top 50. I feel like it's different when you look at the doubles rankings and see that the average age is probably going to be 29, 30. Yeah. I just think it goes back to a prize money thing, right? Like if you're, if you're 25 years old, like you still got some time to try to make it in singles. Okay. Right? A lot, a lot, a lot of guys will crack the top 100 in singles for the first time, you know, mm -hmm. in their late twenties. Um, I don't know if it's the majority, but, but it's not uncommon. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think if you're 25 years old, like you're just not going to worry about doubles right now. Like you're going to keep prioritizing singles because the prize money's 10 X. Um, yeah. so I don't really think it's much more complicated than that. I, I think once, um, you know, if hopefully, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, if, if the prize money can get a little bit closer to, um, that 25 to 50% range that we talked mm -hmm. about rather than eight to 10. Uh, mm -hmm. I think some people might do that. Some people might realize a little bit earlier and commit to doubles a little bit earlier. And then you'll see some of these ages change. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, well, I do appreciate having you on. This is always a lot of fun to talk about doubles and to talk about something that needs to be talked about, at least as of right now, as of recent comments and, I really do appreciate you coming on. If you guys want to check him out, go to his website, thetennistribe.com. Check out his Twitter, his podcast, everything that you can find. I think you can find everything on the Tennis Tribe, correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. on the website. Everything's on the website, so you can find the podcast there, all of our social media profiles and uh, <laughs> doubles coverage and everything like that. So. I and it's always a pleasure to have another tennis fan on the channel as well to talk about it. So, guys, make sure to check out the tennis tribe. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel. We're trying to hit 5k by the end of this year, and we are very, very close. We'd love to have you guys join the tweener at tennis family. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks, guys.